Hello YouTube, this is an Ace Special, and today I'm going to be talking about the news regarding the indie dev company Digital Homicide and professional game critic Jim Sterling. Now, while I'd like to cover the entirety of the events that have led up to the present time, I feel that others such as Jim Sterling himself have done a better job of it in the past, so instead I'll just give you the bare basics here and add links to some of the highlights in the description below. Basically, Digital Homicide has gotten a very negative reputation on Steam for making poor quality games and for outright feuding with Jim Sterling, hurling insults and sometimes outright threats at him. In addition to this, they have been known to use other aliases to bring games onto Steam, sometimes tarnishing the names of legitimate companies that have the same name as some of the aliases. Now, things have been quiet from Digital Homicide for about a month, but then news came up that someone had anonymously threatened Jim Sterling on Tumblr on November 10th. Keep this state in mind uh, for later. Basically, the Tumblr referenced a Halloween special that Jim Sterling had made, in which his neighborhood was visible in the background. The individual on Tumblr then proceeded to suggest that the individual in qu that uh, in question had found out where Jim Sterling lived, and that others could find his residence. This is the part of the story where I personally got involved. I decided to search for evidence regarding the identity of the unknown Tumblr writer. My first suspect, as many of you may have guessed, was indeed Digital Homicide, but to prove that they did it, my first process was to link it to previous confirmed works of Digital Homicide. And in little effort at all, I discovered a Twitter account that the username uh, Peter Lazarki of Im Imaginary Monsters. At first glance, I instantly realized this was a Digital Homicide account, specifically the same account that was originally pretended to be Xenobite Studios Russia. You could even see where they didn't even bother to delete some of the old tweets, for heaven's sake. I then noticed that they appeared to have links to sites which even featured games on Steam. To be honest, my first thought at this point was, CRAP! Digital Homicide is managing to get games onto Steam again. But then I noticed the games, and I noticed something was very off. The games were apparently getting positive feedback on Steam. You know, it speaks plenty of a game developer's reputation when your first major clue that, that a game wasn't made by them is when you notice the review score is far too positive. So yeah, I was convinced that Digital Homicide was impersonating yet another company at this point. So a quick search found me the Twitter account of the real Peter Lazarki, and I was able to me email him so that he'd know that he was being impersonated. That said, I hadn't quite yet proven that the Tumblr account itself was the work of Digital Homicide, but I kept on it. The first major clue, besides the fact that the fake Twitter account, as well as a second confirmed Digital Homicide account, had the links to the mystery Tumblr in the first place, would be the date that the uh, Twitter link was posted. Remember when I said that Jim Serling himself didn't know about the threat until the 10th of November? Well, the guys of Digital Homicide apparently knew of the Tumblr uh, link by November 6th. Four days before even the person threatened knew about it. That was an interesting coincidence, so I felt if I found one more, a much more tangible link between the Tumblr post and the fake Twitter account, I could prove that Digital Homicide was entirely responsible for it all. And that is when I noticed that both accounts used the same avatar. Now it is true that the Tumblr account's avatar picture had a much lower resolution, but if you zoomed it up as I've shown here, you'll notice that it is indeed the same. So that is where the story would have ended, but then Digital Homicide decided to take both the Tumblr blogs and fake Twitter account down, but not before yours truly was able to take some screenshots. I also accidentally left their website still up before I went to work, and the wall went down, so... Na 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 na, I can still see your work. To be honest, though, I don't usually cover this sort of stuff when it comes to gaming. Those of you who have seen my previous work know that I typically am very supportive of indie gaming, that I have gone out of my way to look at hidden gems, and even give some games a second chance. I don't really like the idea of covering companies like Digital Homicide. I believe it's necessary to cover them, so that gamers in general will be more aware of their antics and less likely to get conned by them. Plus, I kinda told Jim fucking Sterlingson that I'd do this video. Still, I've decided that I won't spend the entire video covering the creepy crap that Digital Homicide does, and instead I'll add some examples of good behavior from indie devs, from the sort of guys who deserve and have earned even greater attention than they are getting, and certainly far more than Digital Homicide deserves. First up, I'm going to p mention Peter Lazarki again. Digital Homicide has just tried to drag this guy's name through the mud by impersonating him. So I'm going to casually mention that the game he has already on Steam has caught my eye. I might try to pick it up uh, next paycheck. May even do a video on it. 
Now, I can't do a full review because that might be considered a conflict of interest, but I might let my buddy Moogle have a look at it and see what he says. In addition, he has a game on Steam Greenlight called Halloween Forever, which looks promising, and Jim Sterling actually had a look on it on his, a Itch.io video he did, and seems to have generally liked it. So, it is there for your consideration if you wish to vote for putting it onto Steam. I'll finish up this video, though, by mentioning the company I feel has the best example of being consumer-friendly, of showing more respect to gamers than anyone else I've ever seen, and that company would be Shrapnel Games, a small indie group that gave us Steel Panther's main battle tank, among others. Now, regular viewers will know that I have covered this game specifically in the past, but business practices uh, that do deserve to be mentioned again here, especially as a juxtaposition to the general conduct of digital homicide. The fact is this company offers the game free. Uh, completely free. All the campaigns, the missions, the units, and the updates, all of it's free. You can buy this game for $40, but the biggest change you're going to notice is the addition of widescreen support. Uh, which, by the way, is on an older turn-based strategy game engine, the sort of title that resolution wouldn't really th matter that much on. There's also some minor changes uh, to improve support for tournament players who wish to play tournaments on this, but in general, uh, the regular gamer who, pl who buys the upgrade isn't going to notice any real discernible difference other than the resolution. That being said, I should mention that this game has a is very has a very very steep learning curve and requires very very thorough reading of its very thick manual so it's for a very niche audience to be fair though the only reason I actually bought the upgrade was because I enjoyed the game that much and I felt the devs had actually earned my money so yeah those are my good deeds and news for the day see you guys again soon ASAP